Dr. Plant is an Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Sleep Medicine at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he also serves as the Medical Director of the Wisconsin Institute for Sleep and Consciousness, Wisconsin Sleep, and as the Program Director of the Clinical Sleep Medicine Fellowship. He has served as the chair of the ICSD3 Text Revision Hypersomnolence Section Working Group and chair of the Medical Advisory Board for the Hypersomnia Foundation. Dr. Plant is a clinician scientist who f whose research focuses broadly on central nervous system disorders of hypersomnolence, as well as the interface of sleep and neuropsychiatric disorders. Thank you, Dr. Plant. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be uh, at this meeting. So today I will be talking about some recently published data on uh, the prevalence and course of idiopathic hypersomnia. So the talk is really going to be broken up into two main areas. So we'll first talk about prevalence of IH, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the course. So knowing that everybody's kind of coming from different backgrounds in the room, I want to just make sure that we're on the same page about what some of these terms mean. Uh, so some people are very familiar with the idea of prevalence. Um, some people may not be. Basically, prevalence is a, a number that reflects how many existing cases there are in a population of a disease or a condition, okay? So usually it's considered to be a cross-sectional measure, so a slice in time, how many people in the population have idiopathic hypersomnia. Some people may also be familiar with the term incidence. So incidence is slightly different. Incidence is basically the number of new cases over a period of time. So how many people develop or are diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia within a year, for example. Um, we know very little about either the prevalence or the incidence, and probably even less about the incidence. So I'm going to just focus on prevalence today. So what do we know about the prevalence of idiopathic hypersomnia? The reality is not much, OK? So uh, the original or most of the estimates when you sort of look at pooled data come from sleep clinics, which makes sense, right? That's where a lot of patients with idiopathic hypersomnia are diagnosed and treated. Um, so those estimates have ranged anywhere from 0.002 to 0.01%. So those are numbers that are very, very hard for me to conceptualize. So I think the easiest way to think about them is like, one in 10,000 to one in 50,000 people in the general population would be estimated to have IH using these types of techniques. Um, the challenge is when you use these types of information or these types of data from sleep clinics to estimate how many people in the general population have IH, you run into problems because first, you're only doing sleep studies like polysomnography or the multiple sleep latency tests that are needed right now to make the diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia in most cases when the disorder is suspected. So what that means is there's a funneling and a bias that you're only evaluating people who are showing up to clinics and getting that clinical testing. Um, so there's the other big problem is you're comparing the rates of idiopathic hypersomnia in clinics to the rates of other sleep disorders. So for example, sleep apnea. Uh, and you're not really comparing against the general population. You're looking at a very sort of biased sample in sleep clinics. So it's hard to extrapolate to know how many people with IH are actually out there if you just focus on the, the people who show up to, for care in our, in our practices. So another way that you can estimate the prevalence of idiopathic hypersomnia is to use insurance claims data. So what we do when we do these types of studies is basically we look at large databases of insurance information, and we're functionally looking at claims. So each time uh, a doctor sees a patient, there's a, a diagnostic code attached to it, uh, as well as usually like a billing code for what was actually done, an office visit, a procedure, et cetera. Um, and so you can use these types of information to find diagnoses of idiopathic hypersomnia and associated with various claims. And there was a recent paper that suggested that, again, the, the, the prevalence of IH while increasing of late um, is still about 7.8 to 10.3 cases per 100,000. So again, sort of this puts us in the ballpark of about uh, a little under 10,000 to a little under 13,000, um, uh, one per, sorry, 10 to 13,000 people. So very similar type of estimate when we use claims data. The real problem with claims data is it's a very murky area, 
So um, one, you may be missing people who have the problem but don't show up to care, right? So that's, they're just automatically going to be missed uh, in these types of analyses. Another is there are real challenges with relying on claims data as a diagnostic coding, because the diagnostic coding has to be correct. And for any of you who may work in electronic medical records or things like that, you know that there's sometimes inconsistencies across what codes an individual physician may use or choose. Um, some people may use just the symptom code for hypersomnia, for example, and not idiopathic hypersomnia. Sometimes people will code narcolepsy instead of idiopathic hypersomnia, potentially to get people access to medications. There's a lot of things that can happen that can really make it hard to know are these true cases or people with idiopathic hypersomnia that are identified? And the other problem is in claims databases, you do know, yes, someone had, for example, a multiple sleep latency test. You can look for the, di the, the procedural code that's attached to that. Um, but you don't know what the results of that study would be, right? So you're really sort of dependent entirely on, on the diagnostic coding, which there are some challenges there. So, that brings me to sort of talking about the recent study that, that we, we did, which was looking at the prevalence of idiopathic hypersomnia using a different sort of methodology. And for this, we used uh, the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study. So before I go any further, I just want to thank um, my collaborators within the Sleep Cohort Study. I've been working with them for a number of years. They're a wonderful group. Uh, and so it's, it's absolutely my pleasure to, to work with them. Um, this is the paper, basically, that I'll be presenting this morning. It was recently published uh, in Neurology, so I stole the title of today's talk directly from the paper, so it'll be easy to remember. Um, and these are my uh, uh, collaborators and co-authors on the project, and, and Dr. Mignot will be speaking after me uh, as well. So for those of you who may not be familiar with the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study, uh, it's a really, really important study in sleep medicine. Um, really, it's a, a long-standing landmark epidemiological study broadly of sleep health, and it's been running for a, a long time. So it started in the late 1980s, um, and initially its design was not to look at things like idiopathic hypersomnia. It was originally designed to understand the prevalence, the course, and the consequences of obstructive sleep apnea, because back then we didn't really know much at all about sort of those types of factors with sleep disorder breathing. So it, over time, though, it sort of evolved um, because uh, we were able to sort of get other um, monies, funding to look at other questions around sleep health, sort of broadly speaking. The initial sampling frame was taken from Wisconsin uh, state employees. Um, so uh, what that means is basically they took all the state employees that were there and they randomly sampled people to try to get as, as broad a swath of the population as possible. It's not a perfect um, general population sample because it was drawn from working people, uh, but there are some advantages to that as well because you know also that people will have access to healthcare and some of those other things so you can pull additional data in. Um, but people were followed regardless of whether they stayed state employees. So even if they left their position, retired, et cetera, they've still been part of this cohort study that's still running. We're still doing multiple studies in this, this population uh, even now. Um, and what's really, really important about the sleep cohort study in particular is it's the largest known repository of multiple sleep latency test data in, the, in a population that's not clinically based. Right, so um, there were hundreds and hundreds of both sleep studies and multiple sleep latency tests that were done in these participants, which gave us a very unique opportunity to look at the prevalence of IH in a sort of non-selected population, okay? So, what did we do? Well, we looked at everybody who had some basic requirements who had a polysomnogram followed by a multiple sleep latency test using standard clinical protocols, um, and we looked some people had multiple studies, okay? So we looked at everybody's first study, basically, so as not to, like, bias the sample in that way. And we had 792 studies to look at, so quite a number, right? Imagine doing 792 sleep studies. That would take, take a while to do. So this is a big undertaking. And what we did was we used an algorithmic approach modeled after the International Classification of Sleep Disorders and their criteria for IH. So the first thing that you have to have to be diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia is daytime sleepiness. So we had to operationalize this. 
We use the Epworth Sleepiness Scale, which I think many people are going to be familiar with. And we use a score of at least 11 or more to sort of say that people had daytime sleepiness. So that automatically removed 517 of those 792 people. We then continue to winnow down and remove things that would potentially exclude people from the diagnosis of, of IH. So if people had significant sleep apnea, they were removed. And we, we used a threshold uh, of, of mild or worse sleep apnea using the CMS hypopnea criteria. That may be a detail that may be over some people's heads, but that comes up a lot in terms of mild sleep apnea where you draw the line is, is a debatable uh, point. But we were, I think, pretty aggressive about removing people who had sleep apnea. We also removed people who had sleep deprivation before their MSLT based on self-report. We excluded people who had shift work because we knew that, too, uh, can influence the results of the multiple sleep latency test. And then once we got down to those 74 people left from that original 792, so we're down about 10% of the sample, we actually started to look at the the sleep study results. So on the multiple sleep latency test, we looked for people who had a multiple sleep latency or mean sleep latency below eight minutes, which is the current threshold for diagnosis of IH in the ICSD-3. And then we also looked to see if people had multiple sleep onset REM periods, so to try to identify people who might otherwise be diagnosed with, with narcolepsy to exclude them. So that got us down to 19 candidate idiopathic hypersomnia cases in the cohort. And then we did a deep dive into the records that were available, the charts. We pulled them out of storage, looked through them in, in as much detail as we could. And we excluded some additional patients based on that chart review, um, or sorry, participants, um, for reasons that might also be causing their, their symptoms. So four of them had habitual insufficient sleep, or they're sleeping less than six hours per night. And then three of them had medications that would, were deemed to be likely causal uh, for their hypersomnolence. And in fact, I, one participant I remember specifically was on topiramate, and they said they were sleepy because of this medication. They wrote it in the, the notes of it, which is unusual um, in that case. So, but, but that got us down to 12 what we call probable idiopathic hypersomnia cases. So these are folks who we couldn't identify any specific reason that they would have daytime sleepiness, and they had polysomnographic and MSLT results consistent with the diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. So that's not a lot of people, but it's certainly when you look at the overall sample that we were drawing from, more than we would have expected compared to the prior research, right? So the, the amount of that is, is, so 12 divided by 792 is one and a half percent. Um, now there is a confidence interval. So for those of you who aren't familiar with what a confidence interval is, it's basically the estimate that we think there's a 95% probability that the true prevalence will fall within this range. So that's 0.7% to 2.4%. So you always have to take any measurement you take in research with a grain of salt. But regardless of how you slice it, this is a lot more than, than previous studies have suggested. And I apologize for the data sort of heavy sort of aspects of this slide, but I'll just kind of quickly walk you through it. A few of the main take home points. Um, there was relatively, there's a slight predominance of female women to men uh, in the IH group, but really not that meaningful. And there wasn't any clinical significantly different or statistically significant difference in terms of gender between the IH population and, and the rest of the cohort that we looked at. Um, the, both all groups were older, so that's a function of the cohort study itself and when these studies were done. And we can talk about how that may affect prevalence estimates as well, both sort of in the course of my talk and also if we have time, I hope we have time for question and discussion. The main take on points though, well, not surprisingly, the IH group was sleepier, right? They, we sort of self-selected them to have a higher Epworth scores. Um, also importantly, we looked, one of the other great things about the sleep cohort data set is it has, it's an, an amazing repository of phenotypic data, and in this case, genetic data as well. So the vast majority of participants had what's called HLA DQB10602 testing. So for those of you who aren't familiar, this is a, 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 an, an immune gene that puts you at risk for having type 1 narcolepsy. And if you don't have cataplexy, which I should just be clear, none of these folks had cataplexy either, uh, and you're HLA negative, that really decreases the likelihood of having type 1 narcolepsy. So there was a statistically significant difference between the IH group and the rest of the cohort, but it went, it, it favored 
ba basically the IH people being HLA negative. So again, decreasing the likelihood that this was a misdiagnosis or miscategorization of narcolepsy. And then we also look at other questions that get at daytime sleepiness in the cohort study, and those were also, again, statistically significant, which we would expect, and also the folks that we thought were probable IH cases had more fatigue, which is also not surprising. Um, the only other things that sort of stood out that I think are worth sort of pointing out in this particular talk um, is that there wasn't a statistically significant difference in the amount of sleep that the IH can, uh, folks were getting, but that trended towards them sleeping more on average per night, both during the week and then also on weekends. Um, none of these folks were, would be categorized as long sleepers based on what they were describing um, uh, in their charts. Um, the other thing that's important to point out, I think, is that none of these um, uh, probable IH cases were on sedative hypnotics or sleeping medications, um, and none of them were on stimulants either, okay? Uh, a fair number of them were, though, on antidepressant medications. So um, this is the uh, sleep study data. So this c combines both the MSLT towards the bottom as well as what we see on overnight polysomnography. So there was no difference in things like sleep efficiency, um, but what was really statistically and dramatically different between the IH group and the rest of the cohort, kind of not surprisingly, was the, the IH group fell asleep a lot quicker, right? So they are sleepier. Um, and so their mean sleep latency on the overnight study was under four minutes, so they fall asleep quite easily with normal sleep efficiency, or at least similar to the rest of the, the, the cohort. And there really weren't a lot of differences in terms of like, sleep time uh, either, or sleep stages, maybe a slightly diminished amount of stage one sleep as a percentage, uh, there was a trend level there. Not surprisingly, there was a difference in sleep apnea because again, we removed everybody who had sleep apnea, so the IH group you know, basically doesn't have sleep apnea. Um, there were more periodic limb movements of sleep in the probable uh, IH cases, and that's another point that I'll, I'll talk about. We didn't specifically exclude people from possibly being diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia based on their periodic limb movement indices at night, and that's because a lot of folks, as they get older, can have PLMs that are not necessarily um, diagnostic. They're oftentimes an incidental finding. Uh, most of these folks also did not have, just to be clear, significant restless leg syndrome either, um, or RLS complaints. Um, but there was a statistically significant difference where the IH, probable IH cases tended to have more PLMs. They can also occur in folks who are on antidepressants as well. Um, and then not surprisingly, the mean sleep latency on the MSLT was also lower in the IH group. Again, we used it as a selection criteria. And the, and the mean sleep latency on the MSLT for these cases was about six, okay? So in summary, what, what are the main take-home points? So the, our overall prevalence estimate in the Wisconsin sleep cohort of idiopathic hypersomnia was one and a half percent, again, with a confidence interval of 0.7 to 2.4 percent. We did do some sensitivity analyses and we considered other issues to kind because of, that always is something that you want to do when you're trying to estimate the prevalence of, of a problem like, like idiopathic hypersomnia. So one thing that we did kind of alluding to or getting back to that issue with periodic limb movements of sleep, we went ahead and said, okay, well, let's just remove anyone who had a PLM index of 15 or more per hour. So to exclude the possibility that somehow all these folks had periodic limb movement disorder, which we think was a low probability, but just to take that completely off the table. That left us with a prevalence of still 0.5%, okay? So that's one in 200 people, which again is still significantly greater than sort of previous estimates, okay? Um, also, um, when we talked about not every case was HLA uh, negative, and also there were a few cases that had uh, what we call sleep, like one singular REM episode in their daytime nap study on their MSLT. So sometimes that's considered to be kind of a diagnostic gray area around whether people have type, uh, type two narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, so there are three probable IH cases who had just one sleep onset REM period on the MSLT. All of them were HLA negative. So what that means is very unlikely, again, that they were miscategorized as having um, especially type one narcolepsy. And then also on the overnight, polysomnogram, none of the probable IH cases had a sleep onset REM period on their overnight study. That's important because that finding is also more specific uh, in, in type 1 narcolepsy as well. 
So if we sort of think about this from a broader standpoint, again, our estimates in the Wisconsin Seed Cohort Study are much larger than prior estimates uh, based on either uh, sort of claims data or clinical data in sleep clinics. Um, I personally find this fascinating because our estimate just happened to be very similar to estimates um, um, of hypersomnolence disorder, which is the DSM-5 defined disorder that's similar but different to idiopathic hypersomnia. The main differences between them is that does not have objective requirements for testing. Um, it has some suggestions, but it's not defined the way that the ICSD-3 is. And it also has criteria about impairment related to the complaint, which is not part of the ICSD-3 criteria. But either way, our estimates are almost identical to, to hypersomnolence disorder. Um, and again, we'll probably have some time for Q&A. I'm happy to talk with people even after the talk about why is there a discrepancy between our findings and some of the previous. Uh, it could be that there's just a failure to identify pathology by providers. Uh, it could be that patients have ac limited access to care. It could be that people aren't seeking care or a number of people who would otherwise meet criteria for IH are not reaching out for medical evaluation. There could be a whole host of things. Um, but I, I think that why this research is important fundamentally is it suggests the possibility that the patients who arrive in our clinics that I as a physician and a lot of my colleagues take help take care of or try to provide some relief of symptoms, they may be sort of the tip of a larger iceberg, right, in terms of who's getting care. Um, I think these, this type of research also can impact nosological considerations. What that means is how we may define the diagnosis because there's a lot of debate and interest in that particular area about where we draw lines between, for example, type 2 narcolepsy and idiopathic hypersomnia. One of those is should we have some kind of impairment criterion in the ICSD-3, which we don't currently. Um, but I think also it calls into question of should we, should we consider IH to be a rare disorder? Now, I realize that's kind of a charged word because it can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, so I want to just like point out, so this is a quote from Biedrich Roth when you go back to his like, you know, tome on narcolepsy and hypersomnia and talking about IH and the cases that he described historically. So he said, because I, I was looking through the book, and idiopathic hypersomnia is not a rare condition. That's like, and so he said that other people saw it during visits to countries. I was able to verify it also occurs frequently elsewhere. So when he went to the US, to Canada, and at that time, West Germany. When he used this term, like, or described it as not rare, what he was saying is that his estimates of prevalence were like 0.003 to 0.006. So, what, sorry, sorry, one in three, one in 6,000 to one in 10,000 is what he was estimating. So similar around that to narcolepsy, I believe were the numbers that he was estimating. So not that different from narcolepsy, um, but the thing is how you define rare, like so the Orphan Drug Act has a very different definition in terms of 200,000 or less in the US, which is also a moving target because the population keeps changing. So the term rare is, is complicated, I think I'd put it that way, but it's probably not as uncommon maybe as the way that we should describe it. So with that, on prevalence, I want to switch gears to talking about the course of IH. So this is also an area we know almost nothing about. So I'm going to circle back now to Biedrich Roth and what, how he described the course of idiopathic hypersomnia. Um, so basically this is, I, I apologize for the text-heavy quote, but I think it's worth walking through. So he says, after its onset, the disease usually develops for several months or sometimes one to two years. It then becomes stabilized and an Practically every case remains stationary well into old age. I've observed patients who have suffered continuously with this condition for over 40 years. Sometimes the disease has a fluctuating course with periods of impairment and improvement. This occurred in 16 of my patients, so that was just about 10% of, of the patients he described. And in some, the age of onset and the course of idiopathic hypersomnia are much the same as for idiopathic narcolepsy. So again, his prevalence estimates for sense was that it was about as common as narcolepsy, occurred at about the same time, had a similar type of course. But it did have some fluctuation in symptoms. Like he did point that out in some of his, his writings. There are some key case series of idiopathic hypersomnia also that sort of help us understand what the course of idiopathic hypersomnia may be. Um, so uh, one of the earlier ones sort of followed patients. Again, these are all relatively small patient groups, I'd point out. Um, and what they found was that patients with IH uh, had slight improvement. Some of them had a slight improvement of symptoms over five years of being followed. And that was 
at least in that study, statistically better than the uh, patients who had narcolepsy, which they used as a comparison group. Another case series reported spontaneous improvement or even disappearance of symptoms in about 25% of the cases that they reported of patients who were followed for greater than one year. So that's a relatively large number of 25%. And then another case series reported about 14% um, spontaneous improvement in daytime sleepiness, and the follow-up there was just under four years. So even some of the case series and historical data suggest that some patients with idiopathic hypersomnia can and do get better. We just don't have a great estimate. Um, the only sort of, I would say not, case series are wonderful for helping us initially describe disorders and get a sense of what might be going on, but then we really want to try to uh, study it using slightly more standardized methodologies. So this was a study that was done um, in Asia that actually took persons who were diagnosed with various central nervous system disorders of hypersomnolence in the sleep lab, so uh, slightly biased sample that way, but they had a, a clinical diagnosis, and then they followed them very regularly over long periods of time and called them and said, you know, how are your symptoms? Are you still sleepy? Are you taking stimulant medications, et cetera? And then they were able to plot, these are what we, this is a survival curve, or in this case, it's a remission curve, but it's the same general idea. Um, and they were able to look at sort of what happens to, to the symptoms of these patients over time. So a few really important take home points. Along the bottom in, in green are folks who have type one narcolepsy, so it's narcolepsy with cataplexy. None of those patients had any remission, right? They stayed symptomatic for as long as they followed them, which I think would be consistent with what we know about type 1 narcolepsy. The other three groups, though, um, there was some sense of um, or amount of remission. The group that's remitted the most were people who were, in this study, they were called subjectively hypersomnolent. So these are folks who were excessively sleepy, who had uh, overnight sleep studies and multiple sleep latency tests, but did not meet criteria for either type 2 narcolepsy or idiopathic hypersomnia. Those folks actually had a remission rate approaching 70%. Um, and then the other two groups, so type two narcolepsy or narcolepsy without cataplexy and idiopathic hypersomnia are kind of in the middle. Their remission rate was around somewhere between 30 and 40%. And all of these groups were statistically significant from each other except for the IH group and the narcolepsy without cataplexy group. They've had statistically similar rates of remission. Okay, um, so, and also just to be clear, when they defined remission, if you we were taking a stimulant, that wouldn't be counted as remission. So these are folks who, their symptoms had improved for whatever reason and didn't need treatment any longer. So that's what we know about the course of IH, really. Um, so the question becomes, is there another way that we can look at this using the Wisconsin Sleep Cohort Study data? Because one of the amazing things about the cohort um, is that it's, it's also longitudinal. So it's been following people for a long, long time. And so what we did was we had to, again, operationalize how we would define uh, remission of symptoms. So the, the, the most straightforward thing for us to do was to use the Epworth threshold that we used to define sleepiness. Basically, as if you dropped below that at any point in time, either um, after your sort of diagnostic PSG and MSLT in the sleep cohort study, we could d define that as remission. Um, and then if, if you did remit, we were able to go back and look through the chart to see if there was any particular reason that people's symptoms might have gotten better. So did they get started on a stimulant medication? Did something else happen? Um, what was so powerful about these data is that, again, the cohort's been running for a long time. So the average interval of data that we had to look at was about 12 years plus or minus four, which is remarkable, right, in, an, in what we call a naturalistic setting, so not in a clinical care-based setting, to be able to look at somebody's life over that time, kind of time span is really quite remarkable. And then we also, a number of these folks had repeated multiple sleep latency tests as, as their participation in the cohort study sort of went forward. So we also looked at those results as a secondary outcome of interest. So we had longitudinal data for 10 out of 12 of the IH cases because one of the other challenges with recruitment for any study, especially an epidemiologic study, is people may drop out, they may come and go, it really just sort of depends. But we could look at 10 cases, and here's a very busy slide, so I will walk you through it just so you can understand and get a sense of it. So everybody gets a different color. I apologize if anyone is colorblind. I couldn't do anything, I just ran out of 
the palette choices. Um, the, the bottom axis is time and years. Okay, so this is like how long we sort of had the data to look at. Um, so it spanned almost 20 years in total across all the participants, um, but the average that for each participant was 12. Um, the asterisk marks basically when people had their diagnostic PSG, MSLT, and got labeled as a probable IH case in our study. Uh, and then the other time points are either looking forward or backward at their Epworth data that we had to, to look at the longitudinal course of the disorder. Uh, and then a couple of the, for those of you who are astute, you'll notice a couple of the lines are dashed. Those are HLA positive uh, cases as well. So um, you can see a couple of asterisks that don't have any data that goes anywhere, so we don't know about their longitudinal course. What we do see, though, are these four cases who basically drop, have their Epworth drop below 11. So those, in our operationalized definition, were defined as uh, remitters. Um, and then we went back into the charts to try to see, well, was there a reason their symptoms got better? Um, none of these uh, persons were started on a stimulant or any specific wake-promoting uh, medications. None of them listed IH as a diagnosis that they were, that a physician had told them that they had. Um, three out of the four of them did have some potential reason for their symptoms getting better, although we can't, I think it's hard to describe a cause and effect. Um, one person started drinking a lot more caffeine. They increased their caffeine consumption by three beverages a day <laughs> when they, uh, their, their Epworth got better. Uh, another participant started melatonin and um, um, a carnitine supplement. Uh, and then another participant had been started on an SSRI between their, um, when they were symptomatic and when they were not symptomatic. And then in one case, we just couldn't find any particular reason that symptoms might have gotten better and they were con considered to be spontaneous so we also looked again at the MSLT data that we had that was longitudinal. So we had fewer patients with longitudinal data. We had two-thirds of the probable IH cases, so eight had a repeat, at least one repeat MSLT. Same kind of picture here. Colors correspond to the previous slide of each individual person. Um, a couple of other things to point out. You will notice some um, circles around asterisks and dots. Um, those are for people who had one sleep onset REM period on their NAP studies, um, on their MSLT, uh, and also then if it says like second, fourth, that's the NAP number that they had, the, the sleep onset REM period. Um, so you can see sometimes people have repeated sleep onset REM periods, sometimes they do not. One important thing to point out is that no one who had a sleep onset REM period on one nap in their initial diagnostic study ever had a repeat study that showed two cell REMs. Okay, so none of them ever met diagnostic criteria for narcolepsy at any point uh, during the study. So what happened with the MSLT? So, um, if, so eight of these folks had a second MSLT. And uh, in half of them, the uh, mean sleep latency moved into the non-diagnostic threshold, so above eight minutes. Um, the problem was that for three out of those four participants, their Epworth uh, was still in a, sort of a pathologic range. So I think underscoring some of the challenges of both the repeatability of the MSLT in this particular diagnosis and also the lack of concordance between sort of people feeling sleepy and their MSLT results. Um, and then there were two more participants who actually had a third clinical MSLT in the, in the protocol. Um, and that was done seven years after their first uh, um, MSLT. And again, in one of those folks, the mean sleep latency moved into the non-pathological range. The other one did. But both of them still remained clinically sleepy by their Epworth. Okay. So if we're going to summarize the results of, uh, from the cohort study data on the course of idiopathic hypersomnia, it would suggest that um, 40% of persons may demonstrate symptomatic remission of daytime sleepiness um, over the longi longitudinal trajectory of their disorder. Um, the cause of remission is not entirely clear. In these data, um, uh, we, we might have some possibilities, but there are some limitations to an epidemiologic study. I can't go back and talk to them about what their symptoms were like when they were first diagnosed. I can't do any of those types of things that I might normally do uh, in the sleep clinic if I was seeing them as a patient. Um, and then also, at least one case, though, as far as we can tell, was spontaneous. It didn't have a particular reason. Um, and then again, the MSLT doesn't do a great job of paralleling clinical sleepiness, which I think many people in this room would, would appreciate. So I think that really important take-home points from these data are that 
idiopathic hypersonic can and, and does remit, probably in some people, um, not the majority, but some, and that would be, so our results, I think, are consistent also with other results from the literature and, and case series. Um, so what I think it really highlights is the need to try to identify those who do remit and understand the factors that go into improvement in symptoms, because that may help guide sort of future research and developing novel uh, methods for treatment. So I think sort of other broader questions we should think about is how should we consider IH? Do we consider it to be a permanent disorder, or is it something that can get better? I think that's an open discussion that, that, that researchers, patients, everyone should have. I try to talk about this with my patients personally to try to give them a sense of hope uh, that, that this is not necessarily permanent for every person and we have to continue to follow you and see how things go. Um, and I think also, again, getting back to the way we categorize these disorders, I think it has potential nosological implications. Especially we know that the course of type 1 narcolepsy is very different, where it seems to be a static and permanent loss of orexin-containing neurons with, with permanent symptoms. That may not be the case for at least some people with idiopathic hypersomnia, and also probably type 2 narcolepsy. So it may be important to think about the course when we're segregating uh, different disorders within our diagnostic schema. So I had alluded to some study caveats as we sort of went through. Um, any study is going to have limitations to it, and I openly admit that, and so I'm happy to discuss those. We already talked about age to a certain degree, potentially impacting the prevalence estimate, um, and that can go in either direction, right? So classically, folks with idiopathic hypersomnia will develop symptoms when they are young, uh, early adulthood. Um, so it may have actually biased some of the results to look at an older data set towards decreased prevalence, uh, because actually the MSLT tends to increase, the mean sleep latent goes up as we age. Uh, the definition of sleep apnea is always a factor to consider. We used a relatively conservative definition that, again, could impact the prevalence either direction. By the time people reach middle age, the number of folks who might have IH might have also happened to develop sleep apnea that may or may not be relevant, but they would have been excluded from the probable IH cases the way that we did it. So again, we could overshoot or undershoot the prevalence estimate uh, by altering that. Um, again, we've already talked about how this is a working population that we drew from in the Wisconsin State Cohort Study, so it's a general working population data set. It's not perfect. It doesn't perfectly represent uh, the U.S. population. Um, it was Wisconsin State employees back in the late 1980s. Um, and also, uh, even though people may be participants in the cohort study, and a lot of the cohort study participants really like to participate in the study, that's one of the reasons it's been able to keep going so long, there may be some people who didn't want to, they just didn't want to do the, the in-lab studies for a full day, just as a volunteer clinical uh, epidemiologic study, so that may have led to what we call ascertainment bias. Um, again, none of these uh, uh, probable cases had long sleep durations, so we're not able to really estimate um, IH with long sleep time using the sleep cohort study data. Um, and then there were limitations to the data around other symptoms like sleep inertia, things that are really important um, to persons with IH um, that we just didn't have data on in the cohort at that time. So we can't use that or look at that um, meaningfully. So in conclusion, um, IH may be more prevalent or common than generally considered. Um, there may be sizable numbers of persons with IH that are not identified or do not seek care for whatever reason that may be. Um, certainly some patients with IH may have remission of symptoms, and I think that gives some hope uh, to patients. And then also I think highlights an area that we need to do a lot more research to understand why people may get better uh, so that we can develop new treatment strategies. So um, with that, I want to thank um, obviously all my collaborators, um, uh, uh, fun, uh, f people who fund my research and my lab, um, I, I, and obviously the Hypersomnia Foundation for inviting me. It's been a wonderful 10 years of working with them, and I look forward to at least 10 more. So with that, uh, I'll open it if we have time for questions and discussion. Um, yes, I just wanted to clarify, when you were looking at the remission, they were not on stimulants, or they we're right. On. So none of these, so of the 12 probable IH cases, none of them were on stimulants when they sort of were first diagnosed or we defined them as a case. Uh, 
And then the four cases who had their Epworth drop below 11, so how we defined remission, um, none of them were on stimulants when they remitted. So it wasn't because they got started or put on a wake-promoting drug. Three people started doing things that in theory could affect their symptoms or pull their Epworth down a bit, like the caffeine or starting an antidepressant. Uh, but no, there, it, I would say that's possible, but not probable, I guess is the way I'd put it. Hello, we have a question from one of our online viewers. <laughs> Um, this question says, is there any evidence of IH possibly being hereditary, and what is the possibility of multiple family members having IH, and what would be the reasoning for this? So, fortunately, Emmanuel comes on after me, who knows a lot more about uh, genetics. What I would say is these things can run in families, that we have seen it. Uh, clinic. I don't think we have any sp specific genes of interest, uh, but certainly both, uh, and I've seen patients who have you know, family members with either IH or they may have similar symptoms and never be, have been diagnosed. I mean, that's one of the other challenges. Older generations, the diagnostic clarification of what was going on is a little fuzzy sometimes. Or there also may be people who are diagnosed with type 2 narcolepsy, for example. So there's a lot of overlap, I think, and an area for active research. We don't know any family history, you know, around IH in this group. So we have some family history of disorders, but not about uh, if people have a family history of IH. I saw other hands in the room up. OK, yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, yes, I'm Candace. I have IH, and I was diagnosed almost 14 years ago. Um, there's been a couple of years throughout that time that um, I don't know if I would call it remittance, but like I uh, didn't have like very major symptoms. I had minor ones. They were very like controllable. Um, I didn't feel like my day-to-day -day was, like, severely affected. However, now for the past, like, two years, um, they're the worst they've ever been, and I do feel my day-to-day -day is, like, severely affected. Um, I guess my question would be, would there be a follow-up to that study to see if the people that uh, came, like, with <coughs> remittance, um, if, that, if the IH symptoms come back a couple of years later? Yeah, so there won't... We're limited in the Wisconsin sleep cohort study around follow-up to what we're doing just as a routine follow-up. So everybody kind of gets the same questionnaires. Right now, we have a study that's sponsored very kindly by the uh, Institute on Aging, because the cohort now has also gotten a lot older, and so we're able to look at sort of sleep, health, and uh, risk factor for things like Alzheimer's disease and, and neurodegenerative processes now. But we still are collecting a lot of similar data that was collected before and adding additional questionnaires, but we'll be limited, I think, in the scope. And I don't know how many of these IH cases will make it into the next round. I haven't looked at that specifically because, unfortunately, people do pass away, too. Um, so um, for this study, we'll be limited. I think what you've experienced is really important that you've noticed that. I think when I see patients, I ask them, is there anything that you noticed during that time? Um, sometimes people will notice, if, um, like pregnancy can affect symptoms in different directions or other things in their life or um, that are, um, you know, there can be social things, people can change jobs. There's lots of things that could go on. But so I try to understand that as best I can on a clinical level. But what I really think is crucially important is to, I, you know, now that this has grown so much in terms of the Hypersomnia Foundation, in terms of all these things, is being able to follow people over time to see, do their symptoms change? And if they do, like they did in your case, is see if we can figure out why that might have happened using other different approaches. Like, that may be really key to understanding what's actually at play for driving the symptoms, you know, more permanently, right? So that's kind of what I'm, I'm getting at. Sorry. Um, yeah, so one thing that I have noticed in my change is uh, my work stress. Mm -hmm. um, so stress definitely makes my symptoms worse. Is that something that you've noticed in any of your studies? I think that stress makes everything worse. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I mean, I think that's something that people will, will um, often say, for sure. So, and that may be an important factor that may be modifiable. Like, we don't, but we don't, we just don't know enough. Like, we need to know more. And I think that's what we need to move into. Another question from several of our online viewers. Um, how can I know when my IH began? <laughs> um, that is a great question. Um, so um, 
You know, it's certainly not the time that you have, you know, that your doctor tells you have IH, I don't think, right? Because we're talking about like when did symptoms begin? And a lot of times it's unclear. So I think the best we can do is often some retrospective work when we're talking, you know, and say, well, when did you first notice that you might be different, that you might need more sleep, that you were sleepy during the day? The challenge is I think oftentimes with um, adolescents especially, you know, they may be sleep deprived, they may be staying up late, they may be, there may be other things that as people ascribe the daytime sleepiness to, so it's oftentimes a bit of a gray area of exactly when the symptoms started, unless there was a clear precipitant. So sometimes people can identify, yep, I had a, I had a viral illness, and basically ever since then I have not been the same. So I think it varies from person to person, and you just kind of have to, to make your, your best guess for this the sleep cohort study data, we defined diagnosis basically when they had their diagnostic test that sort of met criteria um, because we had no other way of doing that. It wasn't, a, we, we couldn't interview people and go back in time. Although we could go back in time and look at, you know, whether they were sleepy if we had those data. So one person, they had their PSGM SLT, that was sort of their, where they were diagnosed quote unquote, in, the, in our study, but they had data spanning back many, many years that had Epworks consistently elevated too. So they had probably had a course, my guess, throughout most of their life, and then we lost track of them in the cohort study for whatever reason. So that's a long-winded answer for saying it really depends, but it's hard to pin down when these things start. Other questions? Yes, I see a hand going up. Is there a mic still floating? I don't want to have to ask you to yell. That would be rude. Do you have any upcoming studies where you're going to need volunteers for? I'm sure I do. Um, it depends. Um, so uh, thank you for your interest in research. Uh, and it depends. And I, I do actually want to say that to all people who are interested in research. I mean, we have any number of studies that are either they're funded by governmental sources, there are people. Uh, who are doing uh, clinical trials, medications, all of these things are help driving for the field. We'll try to post them as studies become available as well. And, and I think one of the other wonderful things about the foundation is the idea that we can link research studies to the website as sort of a, a central place where people can learn about them. Um, if any of you are specifically from Wisconsin, feel free to reach out to me as well. Um, okay, uh, good. So a fellow, yeah, ex excellent. Go Packers. All right, um, <laughs> any, any other questions? All right. Oh, more questions. Okay. We do. We have another online one. Um, my morning inertia and cognitive impairments have progressively worsened over the past three decades. Can IH get more severe over a lifespan? So an excellent question. I, I would believe so, yes. I mean, certainly I have patients who get worse, too, from when I first start working with them. Um, I think it's going to be a variable course. We couldn't really answer that in the the um, cohort study data to, to get a sense of like how many people had worsening of symptoms because really we only had the Epworth as like our main sort of outcome measure we could follow longitudinally. We didn't have, I think, some of the um, other symptoms that are so important. So I'd mentioned it as a limitation. Like we couldn't quantify sleep inertia. We couldn't really quantify a lot of other things that may be just as if not more impactful than, than daytime sleepiness over time. So. Um, there's a lot that we need to understand about the longitudinal course, and in the case where symptoms are getting worse, it would be great to identify, again, the reason that they are getting worse if we can, because then that would point to an actionable or target for treatment. So th that's why we, I think we need to understand not just when we first see people, but what happens over the course of everything. Other questions, either online or in person? Okay, well, I will stick around as well um, to hear Dr. Mignot's talk, uh, but then also to answer questions at breaks and things if people have them. So thank you very much for your time and attention and for the invitation to speak today.